Christians in Motion. This is one of those verses that I feel gets taken straight, straight, straight out of context sometimes, you know? What now? But when they call themselves a Christian page and they're posting things that completely go against the Bible, that's where I take it. That's not what that verse is saying at all. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Christian's Motion Podcast. This is, I think it's episode 7. And this week joining me once again is our friend Carlton from the page Husband Tips. So hi Carlton, thanks for being here. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me again. Carlton's a heretic. Yep. Because right. he he believes pineapple goes on pizza. Have you even tried it? The idea of biting into a hot so piece of pineapple. It? I've had grilled pineapple. And? It's disgusting. Well, I, don't, I just don't understand how you can... I might just, I might just hang that. out. And you put mustard on pizza. That's even worse. I learned that in Latvia, and they know how to cook some food, let me tell you. So Latvia is like a, um, a farm country, basically, in, uh, in Europe by the Baltic Sea. And I was there for just a few weeks on a quote-unquote deployment. It was really just a training exercise. I wouldn't call it a deployment at all. Mm -hmm. But all their food is locally grown, and, and the, the whole country is, you know, just like the size of a, a medium-sized state in the United States, so... Yeah, really good. Lots of local, locally grown fruits and vegetables. Uh, and they had this weird, it's not rice or barley, but it's kind of similar to that. I don't know what it's called, but it was really good. It was just a local grain that grows. It looks like a yellow flower. And it's uh, out there in the fields when it's in bloom. But huh. delicious food out there. Uh, yeah. Best cuisine I've ever had. And I would definitely love to retire to Latvia. So you can put yellow mustard all over your pizza? And not be judged. Yeah, they put it. They put it all over my pizza. They did like big, like zigzags all over a whole <sighs> entire pizza, and it was the best thing I ever had. Hold Besides on. the corned beef Reuben, those are the, the greatest. Now Reuben's, we we can agree there. Reuben's yeah. are like one of my favorite things. Yeah, that's my favorite of anything. That really is like probably one of the most hotly debated things in Christian circles. That's what's so funny. That's true. Is whether yeah. or not pineapple goes it's on hilarious. pizza. Relationships get destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I almost blocked you on Facebook. Like, I can't have this guy on my podcast. But I put uh, mustard and sriracha on everything, so. See, well, sriracha, I can get on board with that because I love hot sauce. Like, mm -hmm. any kind of hot sauce. But sriracha is not like, it's a hot chili sauce. Yeah. It's different, it's different intrinsically than any other hot sauce you'll find. Wow, that was such a, like, you could be a food critic. I should be. Like, I felt I like am, I was... Internally. <laughs> yeah, you with your yellow mustard on pizza. That's an abomination. It's blasphemy. It's not. It is. But anyway, um, <laughs> speaking of fruit, <laughs> guess what we're talking about today? Oh, that's a bad segue. Uh, we are talking oh, about yeah. the gay Christian. <laughs> um, this actually came up because a friend of mine asked me to talk about it. Um, I haven't really talked about homosexuality in the past. We did one video in a series we did, um, but I never really wanted to address like issues within the LGBT community because it's not something I know a lot about. So I'm like, you know, I would kind of rather stick to the stuff I know, right? You know, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. but a friend specifically asked me to do a podcast on it. So here we are. Um, I wanted to just establish a few things. I, both Carlton and I know that this is a very sensitive subject. Um, so I, I just wanted to establish a few things before we get into this. And Carlton, you can either agree or disagree, but I'm just speaking sure. for myself here. Um, firstly, there was recently, um, a transgender teenager. I believe he was a teenager, uh, that was murdered. And I know that suicide rates amongst LGBT folk are very high. And I just wanted to be known that that mm -hmm. is not something that I rejoice in. I don't view that as any sort of victory um, at all in the slightest. Um, anytime LGBT folk are mistreated or dehumanized, that's certainly not something that I condone or rejoice in. 
So I just wanted to establish that. Mm -hmm. um, also, behaviors of big air quotes here, Christian groups like the Westboro Baptist Church, I don't condone their behavior either. I don't believe it's biblical or godly or helpful, really. Um, so I don't condone their behavior. As a matter of fact, I condemn it. Uh, and that's just, it's kind of funny to me, though, with the Westboro Baptist Church, like people always point to them. You know that there's like 40 people in that church and they're all related to one another? Yeah, yeah, the uh, Westboro Baptist Church is uh, not a church, it's a cult, and it's just a, mm -hmm. a bunch of uh, family members who, who don't know what the Bible says, but try to act like they do. Great. Well, there was actually like a petition to get them recognized as a hate group, because as long as they're being recognized as a church, they're getting a tax-exempt status. So... Mm -hmm. um, but so, yeah, groups like the Westboro Baptist Church and groups similar to them, I don't condone that sort yeah. of behavior. Yeah, well, I will say that I have actually some um, some mild personal experience with the Westboro Baptist Church. I don't know if you remember, in 2015, uh, in July, there was a shooting in Chattanooga mm -hmm. at a Marine Corps Reserve Center, and uh, yeah. four Marines and one sailor were killed, and... Um, I actually worked the funeral for one of those Marines. Oh, really? And I didn't know him. I did. I did know one of the Marines that was killed. He was from Massachusetts. Uh, his name was Gunnery Sergeant Thomas J. Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was he was actually my recruiter, and excellent Marine. He would served multiple tours in combat, two Purple Hearts before, um, he he uh, received posthumously his third Purple Heart uh, mm -hmm. after Chattanooga, obviously. But um, <coughs> for the funeral I was doing down here in Atlanta. This is for Lance Corporal Squire Wells, who goes by the name Skip, or went by the name Skip. Mm -hmm. I did not have the chance to meet him in person, uh, and I wish I had, um, but the legacy he left behind in town is really good, and everything I've heard from him points that he was um, he was saved, uh, that he knew the Lord, that he was active in the church down mm -hmm. here. But there were some rumors that uh, the Westboro Baptist Church was going to come out and protest his uh, funeral. Uh, I know you, I'm sure you've seen in the past in news they used to to protest um, funerals for, for veterans and hold up signs that say God hates dead soldiers mm -hmm. and, and other things that are just completely unnecessary and I really you believe what you want but there's there's a time and place to say anything and, and right. it's when it's grieving family members you're not that's that's just not okay. Well, and I always think of the scripture that tells us to, to mourn with those who mourn. And, you know, yeah. I was thinking, too, with the recent passing of Hugh Hefner, there is no doubt in my mind that he was a wicked man who led an unrepentant life. But yeah. I'm not going to celebrate his death because I know that there, there were people out there who cared for him that are grieving right now. And that's where, with the Westboro Baptist Church, I'm like, you don't have to like war or people who serve in the war. You don't even have to like the U.S. But all of those people who pass away, they have moms and dads and brothers and sisters. Like, show a little bit of respect. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to make that clear that I think both you and I can agree that we don't condone their behavior. Um, and furthermore, I don't even affirm them as brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't see any... Yeah good fruit coming out of them, but I don't want to make this specifically about them, but I did just want right. to address that. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly, I saw a blog where it was titled something along the lines of the church's obsession with the LGBT community. While we do have our own views of, of marriage and homosexuality, I also don't see it as this unforgivable sin that I think many Christians do. Um, a friend of mine who right. recently came out as a lesbian was kicked out of her church, whereas couples who had affairs that were getting divorced, they weren't asked to leave. And I'm like, well, how, how does that work? How are some sins okay yeah. and some aren't? Right. Yeah, that's, I hear what you're saying. Um, well, first off, there's only one unforgivable sin that's mentioned in Scripture, and it is not sexual immorality. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit, right? Correct. 
Um, <clears throat> but my point was just that I think there there is a certain obsession with the LGBT community, and it, it gets talked about a lot. And when you realize that, uh, according to my research, they make up two to three percent of the population, they get an awful lot of uh, attention, really. I mean, granted, right. yeah, the LGBT community has many straight allies, but when you think about how few people actually are LGBT, whatever, how many of them would identify as Christian, it's a very small minority group for us to focus so much of our energy on. But like I said, I wanted to talk about this because I was asked to. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and one other thing I did want to mention is just kind of a a foundation to do the rest of the podcast on is that we are talking specifically today about gay Christians, people that say I'm a follower of Jesus, but I happen to be gay. Um, We understand that people that aren't Christians aren't going to have the same worldview as us. And we understand that. I mean, they, they need to hear the gospel and they need Jesus, but until they get there, we understand that their views of, of marriage and sexuality are going to be different um, than ours, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so the uh, gay- before we move on, uh-huh. sorry. No, you're good. Um, well, your first point um, about um, not rejoicing in, in in the death of anyone in the LGBT community. Um, mm-hmm. I just wanted to note that we are all created in in the image of God, and uh, God does not. Uh, rejoice in the death of anyone who bears his image. That's right. Uh, when when wicked men die, uh, the Lord does not take pleasure in that. Right. So I just wanted to note that. I don't know the verse off the top of my head. I think it's in Isaiah somewhere. Uh, the scripture reference for that that specific point. But uh, yeah, we can, we can move on now. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Um, okay, so the gay Christian. Um, so recent in recent years, you've had um, Matthew Vine's book. Uh, I, I believe it's called God and the Gay Christian. I could be wrong on that, so don't quote me. Um, you've also had a lot of Christians kind of go down this social justice warrior route. Um, people like Rachel Held Evans and Glennon Doyle... I, Melton, I think her name is, that are like pretty hardcore advocating for the LGBT community. And then we also have entire denominations. Like I believe the the Lutheran and the Methodist church are very gay affirming. And if you go like to P Flag, and there's also a website called gaychurch.org, like you can find a church that is gay affirming. So this is becoming an issue that, you know, as Christians, like, we are no longer agreeing upon. And so it, it is kind of something worth talking about because if people in the church are affirming something that God says is a sin, that's a problem, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, obviously we know what it means to be gay, but mm-hmm. I also want to talk about what it means to be a Christian, right? So within yeah. Christianity, you have your essential doctrine but when somebody takes on that name they take on the name christian we can assume certain things about them like that they aim to glorify god in everything that they do and i believe that's first corinthians 10 31 i always get 10 31 and 10 13 flip-flopped but i believe it's 10 31 that says to do all things to the glory of god Mm -hmm. um And part of the Christian life is also denying ourselves and following Christ. And and Christ knows, and God knows, that sin is very alluring and we enjoy it. That's what makes it so difficult. But we have to continually deny our flesh. And that's a big part of the Christian life is denying the things of this world, denying our sinful, fleshy desires, and following Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, but even people there, there are some that would say, well, maybe it's a sin, maybe not. And they kind of have a very, uh, blase attitude about it. Like, well, well, who cares? I don't, it bothers me when we take sin very lightly, because in my opinion, to take sin lightly is to take the cross lightly and to take 
Jesus' uh, atoning sacrifice for us to take it very lightly. And of course, that's going to be problematic when we do examine a central doctrine. You know, Christianity yeah. kind of is centralized around the cross. So if we're diminishing that, that's a problem. So. Yeah. Um, so going back to uh, on how we aim to glorify God. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes down to uh, everything we do, uh, every action, every, to quote like a really, really kind of like childish kid song that I learned at VBS like a long time ago, like every step I take, every move I make um, should be in Christ. Mm -hmm. Romans 12 says, um, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasable to God which is your spiritual worship, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at um, being a living sacrifice, uh, if something's sacrificed, it means it's given up. Uh, and so if, if we are going to be that sacrifice, then it's our, as you said, we have to deny ourselves. Um, just like Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Right. Um, and, and I <laughs> understand that the same sex attraction that people experience, and we're going to talk about that more here in a minute. Mm -hmm. I understand that it, it does feel so deep rooted, but so does every wicked desire that we have. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I see a lot of Christian men talk about their struggle with pornography, and they know in their head how harmful it is and how it can wreak havoc in their marriage. They know in their head how harmful and dangerous it is, but there's something in them that's still attracted to it. And that, that urge to sin, even if it's not sexual sin, it's very strong, um, and this is where we kind of get back to Psalm 51, where it says that, you know, we've been conceived in our mother's womb, a sinner. Like, you think of children. No one has to teach a child to lie. But they know yeah. that if they lie, they can get out of trouble. Like, it's so deep-rooted, yeah. and I think both of us can empathize with that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you bring up children. Um, when my So I have two children. My oldest is, is my son, and our youngest is our daughter. And... When my when we had first brought our daughter home from the hospital, my son, and he was only two years old at this time, but he had this rubber or, or plastic hammer, a, a toy hammer, you know, from a little toy tool set or whatnot. And he took his little toy hammer and he went over to the table and he started banging on the table with a hammer. Mm -hmm. But he was saying, baby, baby, over and over. Oh my gosh. Uh, and he was... And so we see that that sin manifests um, in children, uh, just mm -hmm. like it does in, in us, completely naturally. Uh, oh yeah, you know, sin rises up from within us. It's not you don't have to learn how to sin. That's that's our nature, right? Um, right, and that's like the point we're trying to make is that you have to continually deny that. And the, I don't mean to sound insensitive, but I've heard people say, "Well, I prayed for God to take this away." And, and the same-sex attraction wasn't taken away. Mm -hmm. But any sin that we turn from, it's going to be a struggle. Because like you said, it's so deep-rooted. It's in our nature. We see it in children as, as young as toddlers. You know, it, it's yeah. not easy to turn from sin. And so for those who, you know, talk about same-sex attraction being a part of who they are, like we can empathize with that. But... Going back to being Christian and denying ourselves and following Christ, as Matthew 16, 24 says, that's what we have to do. We can't continue to indulge in and glorify our own sin, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is where it's going to get interesting because it, there's still so much discussion as to whether or not homosexuality is even a sin. Um, for the vast majority of us, I I think we look at scripture and we're like, well, that's pretty clear. Um, yeah. But I also feel like our last podcast where we talked about biblical gender roles, I also feel that that's pretty clear 
And there are people right. who disagree with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to tackle some of the arguments that are used to affirm homosexuality. Um, one of them is that the word homosexual in and of itself wasn't added into the Bible until 1946, I believe. Um, okay. That is true. Um, but the word homosexual didn't exist until 1892. Yep. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So if the word in and of itself didn't exist, of course it's not going to be in the Bible. And as the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry points out, at that point in time, technology was not what it is today. It was yeah. much slower. So it's going to take time for them to edit the Bibles with more modernized language. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, no, that makes uh, that makes complete sense. Um, you know, the English language didn't even exist until maybe 700 years after Christ. Right. Uh, so it's a, it's a very young language uh, and is ever-evolving. Right. Uh, but homosexual is not even is not the only word um, that wasn't in original uh, English translations. Like if you look at the Ten Commandments and the Sixth Commandment, "Thou shalt not murder" in most, or or you should not murder in most modern English translations. But if you look at the older, like the King James, which uh, was translated or or completed translation in 1611, or the Great Bible, which I think was in around 1598, the Geneva Bible around the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> the sixth commandment was thou shalt not kill. Right. And the word murder in Old English did exist at this time, um, but it wasn't a very commonly known word, uh, and it wasn't really used often. But the word kill at that, that time did mean what we see as murder today, a premeditated taking of life. Right. Uh, and that is the correct interpretation uh, for that passage. And another word that, um, because because some words even change meaning over time. Mm -hmm. Um, you look in the in the in Matthew five. Um, I'm just gonna quote it off the top of my head, and I'm sorry if I butcher it. But uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, the word meek when we when we define it today means uh, shy, shameful, bashful, shamefaced. Mm -hmm. Um. But a long time ago, um, the word meek was a, actually an adjective used to describe a horse that was dressed and ready for battle. Really? Yeah. Um, so, so words change meaning over time. And I think you said earlier already that words mean things. Mm -hmm. and they might not mean things the way they meant things 400 years ago. Oh, real quick about the word meek. Years ago. Um, mm -hmm. The pastor of the church I grew up in, he was very well like he, he knew a lot about greek and hebrew yeah. um in the one sermon he said that the word meek could be understood to mean power controlled and that's what jesus was mm -hmm. and i'm like oh that's, yeah, that's pretty a cool yeah um but uh you mentioned the word murder as used in the ten commandments and right. people use that to say like I mean, I don't mean to go too far down the rabbit trail, but you can't call abortion murder because we understand murder in 2017 America to be unlawful killing, and mm -hmm. ab abortion is still legal under our law. Yeah. And I'm like, that, that's how words can change over time, but my point in bringing up it, the word homosexual being added in uh, 1946 is that the concept is still there. And I mean, yeah, if yeah. you really want to start splitting hairs, the word Jesus wouldn't have been in the original text either, because, mm -hmm. like you said, it, that's an English yeah. word. It, mm -hmm. um, it would have been. I mean, they didn't even have J's in Greek. <laughs> um, his name would have been pronounced Yeshua, not right. Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you really want to start splitting hairs, I mean, none of the Bible would have been in English originally. Yeah. So yeah, and that. I guess I'll I'll jump down the rabbit trail with you. But, um, <laughs> we get into a doctrine called verbal plenary inspiration. Oh, fancy! Um, which is the idea that not the idea, the truth um, that we obviously affirm that that the sixty the sixty six books of the Bible, the Old New Testament, are the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. Verbal plenary inspiration says that the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek are the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. Subsequent translations 
faithful ones anyway, are, you know, 99.99% accurate to the original autographs. But it's the autographs only that are the truly forever inspired word, words of, of the Lord. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Because um, so anyone can pick up, anyone can pick up like like a, a Bible in Greek and a Bible in Hebrew, and, and translate it how they feel like. Does, does that mean that 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 it's it's faithful? You know. Right. Um, uh, and since we're talking about words in the Bible, I have to remind people. I've posted about this before. If you ever want to look up original language, uh, Blue Letter Bible is a really awesome resource to do that. Uh, there's even an option to play the words so you can hear them phonetically. Uh, so it's really, really great if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But anywho, um, so our point is j basically that just because that word homosexual that it doesn't appear in the Bible, that doesn't mean that the concept isn't there. Yeah. And we're going to get no, that, into that, that more. It doesn't in the mean moment. anything because you can. You, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about more of that later, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. So. That debunks point number one. Uh, the second argument to support, you know, well, to affirm homosexuality is, you know, why was Sodom really destroyed? Yeah. And I think Matthew Vines gets on this, saying that it's because they were not hospitable to the foreigners. I'm like, that is the understatement of the century. They wanted to rape them. Mm -hmm. That goes a little beyond not offering them a cup of coffee when they came to visit. Yeah. Um, Sodom was destroyed because they were wicked and homosexuality was listed as one of the reasons they wanted to rape these men and have sex with them. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. pretty clear. I think they actually demanded, um, demanded Lot to surrender angels that were visiting him so that he could, so that the, the Sodomites could make love to the angels. It's in Matt, or, uh, Genesis 19. I'll have to pull it up. But Genesis 19.5? Sure um, well, it starts in 1 and goes to 5. But that's where, like, it was a pretty... You always want to read. You want to always want to read a few verses before and a few verses after. Yeah. Um, the two angels came to Saddam in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Saddam. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself. Or bowed, yeah, bowed himself with his face to the earth. Da, 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 da. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Saddam, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Uh, if you're familiar with Old Testament vernacular, when you get to know somebody, uh, it means you get to enter them physically. And that's that's where I will stop talking about that. But, mm -hmm. And there... Like they, they were kind of demanding this. I'm like, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it seems a little mm -hmm. rapey to me. Yeah, it's it's um that's that's a good way to, to characterize that. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I don't think that we're we're missing anything here. Like this wasn't just and I'm sorry, like God would not destroy an entire nation of people because they weren't hospitable. Like yes, hospit or hospitability wow i can talk hospitality like yes it's a good thing but if you're not hospitable like god's not gonna like smite you mm -hmm. that, that there was much more to sodom than that and carlton read yeah. off he read off well, Genesis I mean, if you, even if you read even if you read back uh you know abraham took intercession on behalf of saddam mm -hmm. um and pled with the lord you know, and it got down to the point where Abraham said, if there is even one righteous man uh, in Saddam, would you spare the city? Mm -hmm. God said he would, but there was no righteous man. No one. Not one. Right. So. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Like, there was a lot of wickedness in Sodom, but among that was homosexuality. It may not have been the only thing going on. Right. But it was definitely one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, then going yeah. on to the next thing people I mean, so bring up. I, that's where we get the word sodomy. Uh, oh, yeah. Words. Which, I mean, people still use that word today. And that's where it comes from. 
But anywho, um, moving on to point number three, another thing people bring up is, well, Jesus never talked about it, which, yes, Jesus did talk about marriage. We're going to talk about that here in just like 10 seconds. But that is also a problem known as red letter Christianity, where we deny the rest of the Bible and only focus on what Jesus said, which, yes, Jesus is he's God and we listen to what he has to say. That's right. But we don't dismiss the rest of the Bible. And I wrote a whole blog on that. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus being called Logos does not negate the inerrancy of the rest of Scripture. Mm-hmm. But Jesus did talk about marriage in Matthew 19. He says that marriage is between one man, one woman, and that takes us back to Genesis 2. What he said in Matthew 19 is almost an exact parallel of what we see towards the end of Genesis 2. So, Yes, right. Jesus did talk about it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm not sure if I should harp too much on the the, the red letter Christianity, but um, the whole the whole of Scripture is God breathed. Uh, so whether the words of Christ and I and I like translations that or Bibles that have the words of Christ in red. Mm-hmm. I just for some reason I enjoy that. But the words that are in red whether they're in red or not, have no more or less authority than the whole rest of Scripture when properly interpreted. That's right. Well, people seem to to forget the fact that Jesus himself never took pen to, well, shouldn't say paper, probably papyrus. (laughs) Well, I mean, all all the gospel accounts are just, uh, they're written by, I mean, I don't think Jesus ever took a pen to anything. Well, I'm sure he did, but Mm -hmm. as far as the actual physical gospel accounts, you know, one was written by Mark, one was written by Luke, Matthew, John. Right. So. <clears throat> but, um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get you off. No, you're good. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. The, the whole Jesus never talked about it, like, well, one, yes, he did, and <laughs> again, what Jesus says does not negate the rest of scripture, yeah. which... And well, uh, I mean, whether he, whether he addressed homosexual homosexuality explicitly or not it doesn't even matter because um, we know uh, that the word of the Lord says that Christ was tempted in every way yet without sin so if we at least affirm that homosexuality is sin it doesn't even matter whether Christ um, spoke on it or not he did not venture into the to the realm of homosexuality right or any other uh, you know uh, sin problem that you're tempted with. Alcoholism. I don't know. Murder. Sure. <laughs> oh God, I hope I'm sure not. there were some Pharisees you would have wanted to murder. <laughs> but. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, okay. If he had, if he had a, a depraved nature, you would have wanted to murder some Pharisees. Maybe. But anyway, we're not getting into Christology right now. No. Moving on. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the next point I wanted to bring up, and this this might be a little bit trickier to address, is the whole, well, I was born this way. I'm attracted to who I'm attracted to, and that that's outside of my control. Now, this is, you might disagree with me on this, and that's, that's fine. You're more than welcome to. But as we kind of said in the beginning of this podcast, I believe we're, we are all drawn to things that God says are wicked. Because we're born that way. We are each and every one of us are born with a sinful nature. And so I don't deny that there are people that from the time they are very, very young have an attraction to people of the same sex. But I don't think that having that attraction is in itself sin. Just like I don't think like if if I see a guy walking down the street and I say, Oh, he's a good looking guy, I don't think that's sin. But to act upon that is sin. And that that's kind of my thought on it. So I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah. Um, uh, so born this way, obviously we affirm that um, all of us have a sin nature. Mm-hmm. And um, homosexuality would be one of those sins that by nature that we are susceptible to. Yeah. No. In addition to that, I think that human sexuality is somewhat complicated i don't think it's Mm -hmm. as simple as as some people like to make it 
I think there's a lot that factors into who we're attracted to and who we're, we're drawn to. Like, people always joke, like, girls marry men like their fathers. And it's kind of funny because I kind of did. Don't tell my husband that. But it's it's not simple. And it's, like, like I do believe that there are people who, for, for whatever reason, from the time they go through the pubescent years can experience same-sex attraction whether it's because of an inborn sinful desire or because of outside circumstances relationships with parents or Mm -hmm. uh even abuse in some cases like i do think it can be somewhat internalized yeah no and you're absolutely right um and i guess i would be a living example of that myself uh so i won't speak too much on it but i guess i'll say that as a young child um there were things that I went through um, that have have I have a lot of baggage now today because of some things I went through as a child, mm-hmm. and part of that is it's not that I'm attracted to men, but it's that the idea of having sex with a man um, is something that I could be te- or I would be tempted to do or something that I would take pleasure in. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have, um, myself, I have viewed and taken pleasure in gay pornography. And so, I mean, it's it's, it's certainly true, um, everything that you just said, uh, whether something that, you know, rises up from within you from birth, um, that desire, or if it's because of outside sources, um, that I guess I mean I don't know the science of it. Mess with your brain chemistry, or or influence the way you think, or you know whatever the case may be. Um, some sin is is things that we learn how to do, and mm-hmm. some of it is just what rises up within us because of our our nature. And it's interesting you said like the way you worded that. I I, I think that there are people that. They, they've they had such trauma in their past that the idea of being with somebody of the opposite sex is just terrifying. Um, and and for yeah. a lot of people that go through abusive relationships, that can often be the case. Like if you have a woman who uh, was, it was in a 10-year abusive relationship, it would be understandable why she would not want to be intimate with men again because there's that distress, distrust there. Mm-hmm. But that's where I'm saying, for whatever reason, a person has same-sex attraction. It's, I don't mean to say it's irrelevant as in like their past doesn't matter. But if the idea of being with somebody of the opposite sex is just like, you know, there's a brick wall up there. I do believe that you can deny the flesh and just remain celibate, which the Apostle Paul seems to think is a pretty good idea for us anyway. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think that's also from First Corinthians, but um, it might not be because I get all of his epistles mixed up in my head all the time. <laughs> yeah, he wrote a lot of them. But yeah, <laughs> um, which is which is great. He wrote the majority of the New Testament, and he was like the the exception to all the qualifications for the office for the office of apostle. But but anyway, that's. That's also not here nor there. Um, uh, but yeah, he did definitely say that um, you're better off to remain in the situation you were when you were called. So whether it was married, remain married, or whether it was single, remain single. Mm-hmm. And um, if you're tempted beyond what you can bear to get married, lest you fall into temptation. I think I just, just quoted like something that he said and something that... Um, he said somewhere else that had nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, there are a couple other verses, too, that are pretty clear in saying that any sort of same-sex relationship, it it can't be holy. Um, I, yeah. I didn't want to just spend, I mean, we could have done a 30-second podcast and just prattled off a list of scriptures, mm-hmm. but that's been done before and it's not really effective. But Leviticus yeah. talks about mm-hmm. it pretty Mm -hmm. clearly calling it an abomination. Um, Again, in Romans 1 and again in 1 Timothy 1, it's talked about again. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also wanted to address, I 
believe it's Glennon Doyle. I, I could be wrong, but it, it doesn't matter. No, no, no. I'm sorry. It was Jen Hatmaker in an interview said she believes that a same-sex marriage can be holy. No, it can't because it goes yeah. outside of what God has ordained. That's and right. the, the other point I wanted to bring up is in the epistles, when we're given, you know, certain parameters for marriage, which we, we talked a lot about that. Um, I believe it was episode five of this podcast. It, we look at Ephesians five and you mentioned first Corinthians, which says a lot about marriage. There's nothing in there for wives and wives or husbands and husbands. It's all for husbands and wives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, every, uh, um, prescription for a husband or a wife was in regard to how he or she should approach his or her husband or wife. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and give himself up for her. You know, wives submit to your husbands and all things. Mm -hmm. There was never husbands um, love submit your husbands. To, right, husbands There's submit to your wives husbands. submit to your wives. Right. So, a lot of that is prescriptive from Scripture, too. Uh, we can infer from the way that we're instructed on how to act as married couples um, what a marriage should look like, and that is one man and one woman. Right, and that's, you know, that's why how we know that a, a polygamous marriage cannot be holy. Like, anything that goes outside of what God has ordained, it, it can't be good. It can't be holy. Um, like, right. you can't have an affair and expect the relationship with your mistress to be holy. And, I mean, I would lump all those mm -hmm. things together, and that's where I said in the beginning, I don't view homosexuality as this, like, big mother of all sins. It is in there with all the other sexual sins, but it mm -hmm. is sin. Yeah. Um, it is, it, it, yeah. Well, it's, it's undeniable. Right. I mean, we, we went through like everything the Bible says and there's nothing, there is nothing, 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 nothing that says that it's okay. And to, as we come to the close of this, People who say, well, just, you know, you love the sinner, you hate the sin. We need to love people and accept people. Look, I don't mean to be harsh here, but the LGBT community, they don't need more parades and hugs. They need the gospel. And yeah. Amen. We're not doing the loving thing by affirming what God calls sin. Because all you're doing mm -hmm. is you're signing their one-way ticket to hell. Yeah. And I'm sorry if that sounds harsh. But the people who want to go to the gay pride parades and talk about what a wonderful Christian they are, to quote Summer White, you're not doing the hard work. You're doing what's easy. It's easy mm -hmm. to go with the flow of the culture. It's not easy to look sin in the eye and confront it. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, a lot of people will harp on, on you for, for correcting them or calling out their sin. But, mm -hmm. you know, Proverbs 27, 6, um, Tells us that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Mm -hmm. So if if what I say, if my correction or my rebuke um, hurts you, um, that that correction, that rebuke, or that discipline, or, or whatever you know, whatever it was that I did that was done in love, um, is better than if if the enemy um, were to come up to you and say, oh yeah, it's okay, uh, you can you can live this life the way you want to according to your will, mm -hmm. um, because the enemy is the enemy of lies, and the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. That's right. And I mean, of course, this is a, a lesser thing, but it, it, you just made me think of it. I, it. It's also part of growing spiritually, is understanding that when your, your brother or your sister in Christ does confront you, like, first of all, understand that they, they probably spent a long time summoning the courage to confront oh, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even little things, like, you remember a couple weeks ago, I sent you a blog to revise. I was like, pick this apart. If you find yeah. any errors, let me know. And I'm not trying to, like, mm -hmm. pin a rose in my nose, like, I'm such a wonderful Christian, <laughs> but... I have gotten to a point where I say to people, like, if you notice an error in, in a blog or in a post, like, please call me out, you know, and, and that's, that's part of growing yeah. as a Christian is that we do yeah. learn to accept correction, 
and we understand that our brothers and sisters in Christ, they have our best interests at heart, and they're doing this out of love. It may not sound good to us or feel good to us in the moment, but it is the loving thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, you said about um, rebuke, and here's the other thing, too, and this is why I wanted to mention it in the beginning, like that we're talking specifically to gay Christians. Look, I'm not going to go to a gay pride parade and start smacking people upside the face with a Bible. But when you mm -hmm. come into the church and you want me to affirm you as a brother or sister in Christ, then things are a little bit different because now you are subscribing to the Christian worldview. And so now things are a little bit different than if you were outside of the church. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I, I wanted to just conclude with this and, and I just want to hear what you have to say. What, would you say to the people who, who do say that, like, well, we have to love the sinner, hate the sin, which isn't a Bible verse, by the way. Yeah, and that's not a Bible verse. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to say that I hate the sinner. Um, but there's, there's definitely scripture to say that God hates unrepentant sinners. Right. And, and I don't say that to mean... I'm not trying to tell you, if you're listening to this and, and you're an unrepentant sinner, I'm not telling you that God hates you. <laughs> but you can open the Bible and look at those things. Um, <clears throat> but what it comes down to is, um, so love the hate the sinner, hate the sin. I don't know if that came from like the Billy Graham era of evangelical <laughs> Christianity. Um, but it's, it, I mean, you're right in saying that it's not a Bible verse, but it's not necessarily wrong in the way that we approach, um, other people who bear the image of God and, right and how we, I guess, attack the issues in their lives. Um, I think my big issue with it though, is how, like, like you're right in saying it's not necessarily. Yeah. So, so well, here, here, let me, let me, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off, but. Um, okay. In Proverbs, right? Um, we get into parenting here because I'm always thinking about my kids, but <laughs> I can't think of the specific verse. Um, but something along the lines of, "He who spares the rod hates his child." Mm -hmm. If I don't correct my son when he's, you know, hitting his sister, or or um, running into the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. Or, or whatever, if I don't correct him, is that because I hate him? Or, or rather, the Word of God is telling me that since I'm not correcting him, I must hate him. So if I'm not correcting you, sinner, uh, you unrepentant homosexual, or you, uh, you know, X, Y, Z sin here that, that you're living in and basking in and marinating in, if I'm not correcting you, that means that I hate you. But if I love you, I will correct you. That's right. Yeah. You know? Does that make sense? And just, we'll, we'll conclude with this. And sometimes you mentioned if, if your, your son was running to the street, I guarantee if you saw him running for the road and there's a semi coming down that road, you're not going to say, now, 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 don't do that. You're going to grab him and pull him back and you're yeah, probably going to right. yell. Your wife's going to cry. It's going to be a very mm -hmm. intense moment. But Absolutely. you're doing it out of love because you don't want yeah. your son to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we can't affirm what God says is sin. And if you are struggling with homosexuality, I think you need to reach out to someone in your local church and, and talk to them about that. Get deep into the word and pray and deny your flesh. I think that's what it comes yeah. down to, really. Mm-hmm. Um, anything you want to add before we, we sign off here? Um, you mentioned earlier something about the Lutheran Church um, being more accepting, or accepting of homosexual yes. um, in their church. Um, I would say that if it's like a, a, a consistent, confessional, Orthodox Lutheran Church, that that would not be the case. But okay. if it's like ECLA, E-C-L-A, that denomination, they're kind of like the the PCUSA of Lutheran churches. And if you're not familiar with PCUSA, it's Presbyterian Church of the United States of America. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they have um, open homosexuals serving as, as priests and ministers and, and deacons and mm -hmm. 
I guess I'm not sure if priests is a word. I'm not I'm I'm Baptist, but I'm not sure if priest is a word that they use in the Presbyterian circle. I don't think it is. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, not Lutherans generally, just ECLA, ECLA, they call it. Right. And that's why when you are looking for a church, I always tell people, like, you need to go find the confession of faith from their denomination, and the specific church should have one as well. Yeah. And you need to check that out and know what you're getting into before you, you really plug into and connect with the church because mm -hmm. i mean a, the perfect example is you have like the quote oneness pentecostals which not that i'm a big right. fan of the pentecostal church either but they're much different mm -hmm. than a, a typical pentecostal church you know what i mean yeah. so you can't always mm -hmm. assume something yeah. based on the name of the denomination does that make sense right. yeah no that makes total sense okay um All right. Anything else? Um, yeah, uh, in our notes, you have something about kicking people out of the church, and we didn't go over that at all, so I don't know if that's something you still wanted to address or not. Uh, well, you tell me, Carlton. I'm I'm should the church, should want. people, like, should they be kicked out if they are an open homosexual? Should they be kicked out? <laughs> well, I'm not, uh, you know, it depends. Is this person a... Uh, if they're a, a church member, uh, as in, you know, because cause you, can, you can attend a church every week for years and years and not, not um, go to their, most churches have membership classes and you have to commit to certain things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually not currently a member at the church that, that we attend um, mm -hmm. you know, because I really can't commit to being there every week and being actively involved because of my job. Mm -hmm. I'm always going away for weeks or months at a time. I just can't I can't be an active part of the church as, as much as I would like to. Right. But um, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians, there was an instance of um, sexual immorality in the church. There was a man who was um, having sexual relations with his mother-in-law, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that uh, this man needed to be disciplined out of the church, uh, and so that's what they did. Mm -hmm. um, and then, if you come back later and you look at Paul's second epistle to the church in Corinth, um, you'll see that he says this discipline led to this person having sorrow, and this person's sorrow led him to repentance, mm -hmm. um, and he was allowed back in the church. Uh, so I'm not necessarily against kicking people out of the church. I think it's um. I mean, we need to do everything in grace. Um, but obviously, if, if we look and see that uh, you know, it was done in the past, um, and it's biblical, um, and it's done for the reason of we want this person to be corrected and come back in repentance, right? then I and think overall I think that that would be okay. But I, I think there should be, I don't know, I don't want to get too much into polity or ecclesiology. But there, I'm sure there should be some uh, levels of church discipline, like right. Um, you can't be a member now. You can't um, if it's a Baptist church. A lot of Baptist members, the members of the congregation, will vote on certain things or whatnot. Right, and I'm a big believer too that any form of church discipline it, it shouldn't come as like a blind side. Like you shouldn't be pulled into a meeting and be like, "Whoa, what the heck just happened?" You know what I mean? Like. It's something that, like you said, extending grace. Like, I, I believe church discipline should be a gradual process. And, and maybe, if necessary, it leads to being asked to step out of the church. But yeah. I, like, this happened to me when I was younger. I, my parents got a divorce and people in the church didn't yeah. want to deal with it. I was actually mm -hmm. church staff at the time. I was a teenager. I was just brought mm -hmm. into a meeting and told, you're fired, you need to go. And it yeah. it was a total blind side, and they didn't even really give me an explanation. They just told me that I was not fit to serve, and that was that. And it was a total blind side. And to this day, I don't know what I did, and I don't think church discipline should ever be like that, where people are totally yeah. caught off guard no, and they have yeah, no I'm, idea. I'm sorry that that I'm sorry that that happened to you. That, that. oh, it, that was and, uh, years just ago. Being being a uh, well, I mean, being a teenage girl and just having someone uh, 
say that, you know, bluntly like that to you just sounds mm -hmm. um, really lacking in, in grace and gentleness. Well, and plus, you know, I was 16 and I was yeah. working with children, like I was serving in mm -hmm. children's ministry and he referred to me as a troublemaker. And the thing that always makes me laugh, I'm like, if I have a 16 year old daughter that spends her free time watching babies, I wouldn't exactly call her a troublemaker. <laughs> Especially watching yeah. babies in a church. I'm like, come on now. But mm -hmm. that's another conversation for another yeah. day. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Carlton, for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. And now I, I sent you a mic, so now you're you're locked in to future yeah. podcasts. Whenever I yeah, well, I, I paid for it now, so you what? I said I paid for it now. No, no. That was like a twenty or thirty dollar mic. Okay, so, so in a couple months, I will have paid it off. Yeah, you have to work off your debt. <laughs> yeah, I'm a slave. <laughs> that could be a future podcast, but the slavery. I'll be willing to talk about that. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. Okay, let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs>